What's up everyone, Jay's Two Cents here, and before we jump into today's topic, I want to remind you all that I am currently doing a giveaway of one of my GTX 1080 Founders Edition cards, one of my very own cards that was intended to go in Skunk Works before we ended up going with the Titan Xs. It is a worldwide giveaway, you guys will find the link to the giveaway down in the description of the video. But I'm not only giving away the card, I'm also giving away a full cover Plexi Nickel EK water block, as well as a nickel backplate for it. So yeah, you definitely don't wanna miss out on that. It is available worldwide, except where prohibited. But the topic of today's video is definitely guaranteed to ruffle some feathers, upset some people, and that's perfectly okay with me, because we are gonna talk about five PC myths that you shouldn't believe. Hey guys, don't miss the Overwatch Cooler Master Invitational on July 15th and 16th at Esports Arena in Santa Ana. The tournament gives 12 high school robotic teams a chance to compete for a grand prize of $40,000 directly benefiting their school's robotics program. So save the date and come on out to the Esports Arena in Santa Ana on July 15th and 16th. Now the first myth here is kind of a two-parter and it basically says you can't build a PC on carpet. Now that kind of ties into the whole anti-static or ESD, electrostatic discharge argument, which is if you accidentally shock something in your system, you can damage it. Now that's very true, but there's a lot of things that have changed over the years. A lot of components these days have very good ESD protection. A lot of motherboards specifically now have ESD caps on there. They're designed to absorb any ESD that might accidentally make its way into the system. And I'll tell you right now, almost every PC you've seen built on this channel and just about every PC I've ever built in the history of building PCs, I've done while sitting on carpet. And the argument with carpet is the fact that it can build up static charge. If you've ever walked across carpet with socks on and touched a doorknob, you know exactly what I'm talking about. So the fear is that you would accidentally shock something on your system and kill it. Now that doesn't mean that even though we have ESD protection today that you can't damage your components. So that's why I say it's somewhat true, but you could damage some of these smaller components in your system, for instance, HDMI ports, USB ports, uh, Thunderbolt type C ports, these types of things, if you get a charge that accidentally makes it directly into the port, that could cause damage. I do know of people who have killed ports that way, but you've never actually destroyed the system. That's, we've come a long way in ESD protection. Now this next one's a good one. I hear it a lot amongst people who are sending me build lists or asking me questions, and that specifically is, can an oversized power supply damage your computer? Well, the problem is a lot of people who don't really understand power supplies and electricity and how these components work together is they tend to think that if your computer only needs 500 watts to run under load, but you hook up a thousand watt power supply that you're sending a thousand watts to your computer. I've seen a lot of comments saying using an oversized power supply can damage your system and that just boggles my mind. The way a power supply works is it's only going to supply the amount of power that the computer needs up to its max rating. So a thousand watt power supply can supply up to a thousand watts of power to the components. Now that doesn't mean it's sending a thousand watts at all times. Now the reason why you'll see people use oversized power supplies and me being one of them is I want to kind of try and size the power supply to be more in the peak of the efficiency curve. Right around 50% is where 50% usage or load is where a power supply is most efficient. So a thousand watt power supply supplying power to a 500 watt system would be at the height of its efficiency curve. But of course there's going to be a huge diminishing return in terms of cost where you're going to spend a lot more for a thousand watt power supply than say a good 650 or 700 watt power supply, which could also maintain that same sort of efficiency curve. So you want to pay attention to diminishing returns and not go too big. The only thing you're really gonna destroy when you use a power supply that's too big is your wallet. Now this next one's a pretty popular myth and you've probably seen it if you've ever been to any sort of PC forum, Facebook group, or even the comment section of my videos. And that is you can speed up a slow computer by adding more RAM or technically downloading more RAM as this, some people call it. Anyway, I digress guys. That really depends on why your system is running slow in the first place. Do you have an extremely undersized or underperforming CPU based on the tasks you're asking of it? Are you talking about gaming performance and you have a very slow GPU? Well, things like that, RAM is not gonna actually help. Where RAM is gonna help is if you have tasks that are utilizing a huge amount of data being stored in the memory, CAD drawings, uh, video rendering or huge Photoshop projects. That stuff is heavily RAM dependent because all of those previews and stuff are stored in memory. And what happens when you run out of memory is your computer doesn't just shut down. People seem to think if you have too little memory and you ask more of your memory than it has capable, that your system's just gonna blue screen or shut down. That's not true. What happens is it starts to access what's called a page file in the Windows environment or a swap file in the Linux environment where that data is then stored on 
the hard drive, or even an SSD. The problem is even M.2 SSDs are extremely slow compared to the data rates and transfer speeds of the physical memory itself. So if you're starting to have to share data and swap files with your hard drive, that's what's gonna slow down your PC. So most gaming PCs, home PCs, or home PC environment are not gonna be doing things that need more than roughly 16 gigabytes of memory. But having faster memory and more memory is of course gonna have a diminishing return just like power supply. So it really comes down to what you're doing with your PC. Now this is one I've actually heard quite a bit considering the fact that I used to work in IT uh, in an enterprise environment was this is a good one to talk about and that being gaming PCs make terrible workstation PCs and, and that I don't entirely understand. Now unless we're talking like full on CAD rendering PCs with multi CPU Xeon systems with you know 128 gigs of ECC registered RAM or whatever you're building servers, then this doesn't really make a whole lot of sense because I don't know about you, but most gaming enthusiasts tend to go quite overboard with their hardware. More often than not, they build PCs that are way above and beyond what they need to play their games. That's because they're enthusiasts and they like high grade hardware. At least most people here, if you can't afford it, you would use it if you could, you know what I'm saying. So I don't understand how people can say gaming PCs are not good workstation PCs. Oftentimes they have at least 16 gigabytes of RAM or more. They tend to have multi-threaded CPUs, usually as some sort of i7 with hyper-threading or now a Ryzen with all these cores, which would make a great workstation PC. And now with GPUs being used in a lot of day-to-day -day tasks and a lot of uh, programs able to offload onto GPU encoding, it makes more sense than ever that a gaming PC is really a dual purpose PC. You can work on it and you can game on it and no longer do you have to have a specific build guide or direction based on that use case. You can now have a gaming PC that you can also build an entire business based off of. Now this next one I know is one that we have all heard, guaranteed. If you've ever read any discussion on any website or a YouTube comment or anything regarding GPUs and GPU performance and high refresh rate monitors, it's who cares? The human eye can only see blah, blah, blah FPS anyway. And you can replace blah, blah, blah with any denomination because nobody can agree on what the human eye can actually see. Now I can tell you there was a really good discussion that took place on Reddit. Yeah, I know, right? I read a Reddit post, very strange. The general consensus, at least amongst eye experts, was that the human eyes and the nerves can fire anywhere between 300 to 1000 times per second, sending information to the brain. And that information travels at 200 miles per hour from your eye to your brain. And I don't know how they measure that, but whatever. Again, I'm not no, I'm a tall optometrist, but I can tell you that most people in here actually agree that the human eye can see approximately one one thousandth of a second. Now, how that actually translates to FPS, I don't know, but what I can tell you is that what we can definitely see is the variation between frame rates. Yeah, TV is only at what, 29.97 FPS, movies are at 24p or 24 frames per second, and the reason why that looks super smooth is because of two things. One, extremely consistent frame intervals. The frame is being re-rendered and redrawn exactly the same amount of time between each frame. So that gives you a lot of smoothness. The second thing is when you're dealing with video cameras and stuff like that, there's a lot of motion blur. So you get blurred images between those frames, which makes it like, that's what we're doing right now. This is, this is looking super smooth at 30 FPS because of the fact that the frames are blending together. In games, it's not like that. It is a very harsh redrawn frame over and over and over and over. There's no blending between the two. So of course they've added things like motion blur to games to try and give it that cinematic effect, but most of us turn that off anyway. But the problem is if you're getting 60 FPS and then 75 and then 58 and then 62 and 71, that's a constant change of frame rates where you're getting different gaps between frames as things are adjusting to what's happening on screen. So that's why you have now frame uh, pacing a technology like FreeSync and G-Sync, and V-Sync's of course been around for quite a while, where the point is to draw the frames consistently. There's no conclusive argument to this, and that's certainly not gonna happen today because the problem is all of our eyes are different. All of our brains work at different speeds. Again, read the YouTube comments and that will make sense to you. Not everyone's brain fires at the same time. Not everyone's eyes are transmitting the same speed of information and not everyone's eyes are created equal. So of course it's a very subjective subject matter. Subjective subject matter, if that, yeah, you know what I'm trying to say. Guys, go with fast GPUs, go with high refresh rate monitors and enjoy it. I promise you will see a difference. And if you say you can't, why well, refer back to the, the brain firing speed thing. So anyway, I had basically asked you guys on Twitter last night, tell me your top 
PC myths and uh, maybe would make it into a video. And basically what I did was I took the ones that seemed to be reoccurring and a lot of people were mentioning over and over, and those are the ones that made it in here. Maybe we'll do another installment of this video where we talk about five more PC myths you shouldn't believe. Here's another myth you shouldn't believe, and that's the fact that Jay is a PC fanboy and doesn't like Mac. Well, 